right. Meera Ganapati without the invisible last name. How <laughs> how are you doing? What is up? I want to say shout out to Manvi Menon for hooking this uh, conversation up. I've been voraciously consuming articles on Soup Journal, especially the ones that you have written. And I have a bunch of questions. Before we dive in, I would like you to take the opportunity to introduce yourself to the listeners and audiences because I think it's best if you do it. I might butcher it. Okay. So hi, thank you for having me here, and thanks to Mando for putting hooking this up. So um, I'm a writer. I'm based in Bombay, and uh, I run a publication which is an independent digital publication called The Soup. and um, yeah i pretty much do that i write stories i write short stories and i write sometimes write books for children mm. so yes fantastic talking about books for children let's get into that first because i know manvi was on the episode as well we we talked a bunch right. about children's stories i come from a generation i was born in 97 and uh, where my parents pretty much bought books for me from you know the average stationery wala bhaiya something like that right and so you had almost no i would say maybe like taste or curation in those stories it was just how much a publisher could fit how many morals a publisher could fit into you know 50 pages so right. you have very tight stories then maybe like 30 renditions of akbar and birbal all of those things so i don't exactly remember a children's author growing up but i just have a hazy sense of a bunch of different stories with morals in my head okay how much how much has the children's publishing space changed since then because what i see on pratham books instagram what i see on you know even you know jagarnot books uh, initiative towards uh, writing children's books is that there clearly seems to be a rise in young parents wanting to buy uh quality stories for their children something that maybe was not available to my parents or even your parents for that matter um yeah that's a lovely question so i so basically when i was a kid it, it was pretty much the same thing what what was available hmm. uh was what was given to us and uh, at that point i think this was just fading out but we had a lot of russian uh, fairy tales and russian propaganda books surprisingly which used to end up in our house and i'm glad for that because it really was a lot of gory stuff a lot of if i can say fucked up stuff like, absolutely yeah yeah so it was all very um it was an interesting thing because you're exposed to this on one hand and then there's also there was also chanda mama i don't know if you remember that yeah and there was tinkle and of course there were a lot of morals and all of that but uh i think what uh it was what was interesting was the books that were meant to be read by us were usually enid blightons And mm. uh, uh, are you, you talking know, about the famous that, five series or even the secret seven, something along those lines? All of them, like, and yeah. even the ones which were Saint Clairs and all of these books about boarding school kids. So there was this world that we uh, had, which was absolutely inaccessible to us. Like, mm. imagine, uh, I, I remember I used to write books, like whatever. I used to write stories as a kid, and all my characters were like Caitlin Bennett. and you know uh, <laughs> mary uh, like some carlson and you know so very right. unusual name they had blonde hair blue eyes and they used to go for these picnics where they would eat uh, they would sit on uh, sit in the hills rolling hills and eat all these fabulous things which none of us had ever eaten and i think the difference between that time and now very clearly is that uh, the stories that are written by pratham atulika or even tara uh, which takes a lot of uh, folk art and all of that is that these are stories that people can relate to children can relate to adults mm. can relate to um, i'm seeing someone who looks like myself who is named like me who eats things i do so what has changed uh, more than the morals itself i mean that i think that's just gone out the window the morals aspect it's about inclusivity i think a lot of books are much more uh relatable than they ever were and the storytelling mm-hmm. itself has also changed it's not it's not about uh, uh this goody goody child went here and saved this person and therefore she's a lovely person no it's about a slightly flawed character sometimes who has uh-huh. pr- problems pr- probably suffers from depression or whose mother or father is an alcoholic there's domestic violence there's uh you know uh, uh 
a lot of ideas about lgbtq uh, you know like not you don't there's no regular or a typical way of talking there's a lot of different conversations which are happening mm-hmm. and um, yeah i think that's what has really changed so would you say that considering that you read russian literature and even propaganda as a kid by you know chance occurrence that those books had levels of moral ambiguity not seen in the indian uh publications that were being put out at that time and then do you see that same moral ambiguity reflected in the children's books now where like you said the characters are flawed it isn't about putting a ribbon at the end of the story about everything going well and what are the implications of introducing that ambiguity to kids right now because if i if i have to take a personal sort of stance on this i would say you read all these stories about uh, you know a perfect world and then in your life you are exposed to i think like all of childhood is one big ptsd that if you are like smart enough you can you know either humor your way out of it or write about it something along those lines mm-hmm. but 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 the but the stories that you read don't reflect the reality that you live in so in a way are our children's books now reflecting that reality have you moved past the trite lessons um see i think there are different kinds of it's not easy to say uh, okay i'll begin with the beginning of your question which okay. was whether uh, these russian books and uh, all the tinkle and all of that stuff that we read were they in any way similar at all Uh, so a lot of the russian books were fairy tales and they were quite i did not know russians were capable of fairy tales <laughs> they were you know there was this uh, character called baba yaga who is a witch who mm-hmm. basically eats children so it was really gory and uh, we also had like rip van winkle and all these uh, all of the fairy tales were actually quite dark and depressing if you read about the little mermaid the actual unabridged version it's a very uh, scary story so initially these stories were never written with okay a, t- a child has to be taught to be a certain way i think that's something that happened um somewhere along the lines which i don't know if that's the right way uh, to really get to a child you you're, you're talking at a child rather than talking to them mm. and even people like rural dal for instance they are not nice they are not like there there are uh, husbands who are feeding their wives worms calling it spaghetti so these are not tales of good human beings at all there's no real mm. moral there's uh, just it's it's drawing from life and reality and those are the books that are the best kind of books i think uh, right now um the books that are coming out again i don't think the ones at least that i know of and work with they're not about morals either uh, it's more about telling a child okay this is wrong with you or this is wrong with your life that's totally okay like recently i saw this book about knowing your body and mm. uh, i wish there were such books when we were children mm. about uh, telling us about it's okay if you're this skin color or if you're this size or you're thin or small big tall it's all good because there are all kinds of people in the world so i think what's happening right now is the child is being told that you can like yourself as you are these things happen and they are okay and it's more like easing you into the process of life rather than teaching you how to be so mm. that's the difference i would say it's not morals it's more like a le- a sort of easy and fun guide for life in a way mm. so we've moved from the didactic to something that's a bit more i don't know like around self acceptance i can the only thing i can think about when it comes to uh being okay with ugliness is the ugly duckling which is something that is etched in my memory because it's this the story of this duckling who hates himself or herself because it's pretty ugly but then ends up being you know a beautiful swan something along those lines and i i remember seeing right. uh, reading that story and feeling that something like this would happen to me one day because i remember in school uh, i had a pretty big head so and someone said you know your head looks like a pizza slice I joke about it now. Uh back then I was like, oh shit, this hurts so bad. I wish I wish I had like a normal sized head. Right. Um I don't know when the beautiful swan woman happened. I hope it's happening right now, but um I, it's 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 very interesting to see these stories in re- retrospect and see how they inform your psyche and the way you lead your life. 
and i wonder if there are stories in your own childhood that you distinctly remember that now you look at them sort of you know in retrospect make sense to you about the sort of decisions that you took or the person you become for some reason i can only think of supandi <laughs> <laughs> so Pandi I've heard the name I don't know what uh, the story is about I don't know so Pandi is no. a I mean he's this character who has a really long head and he's supposed to be stupid and you know he does all sorts of ridiculous things and uh, no so Pandi didn't really have an impact on my life but I just suddenly thought of him but but um the books that had an impact is such a difficult thing to gauge but i remember mm. one particular book the house uh, on the house with red roofs which mm. is not a very popular book and it was one of those obscure things that i just happened to find or my dad gave it to me but i found that very uh, helpful for me because as a very young child i was exposed to people in my family passing away and when i saw a story about a child who went through something similar it i felt seen you know mm. i felt like okay there is this happens and it's fine because there were no books talking about death or grief or losing a parent or you know those those are very important conversations which a child should have you obviously have them with elders in your family but when you read about it you connect with it mm. it's someone like you which i also felt now uh, when i was a little bit older with harry potter Mm. again there was a boy who wasn't perfect he was not correct for the world he was not correct for all the responsibility that he had to deal with this big villain you know and he was scrawny he was like an underdog and he has to fight his own battles with himself and his head and then emerge as whoever he has to be so there there were a few books which i found quite useful uh, or quite relatable i would say hm and now you write children's books how how did that come about and the other part of the question is how is it different because the stuff that you write for soup is very reflective very personal is is meandering in its own beautiful way but with children do you perhaps incorporate the feedback from children do you write with the intent of knowing would you write with the intent uh, of trying to be understood by a child what is that process like and how is it different from writing for soup so um, any kind of writing i think if they are writing for children or adults mm. it, it has to come from a place of honesty i uh, often write i mean i read this recently you know uh, about poems that only the privileged can write about flaws if you really have <laughs> some struggles in your life you're never going to write about flaws right yeah. so i i keep thinking that any kind of writing you do and i often fail i'm not perfect i keep writing about rubbish also but by and large i try and draw from some kind of truth either in myself or something that i've seen so mm. half of my stories are based either on my brothers his behavior or my cousins or like my friends kids or something that i did myself so um, i based uh, uma versus upma one of the books i wrote about a child who has eating uh, who doesn't eat all her food i based that on my brother who had a mm. habit of not finishing his breakfast he would stuff a boiled egg in his mouth <laughs> and pretend you know that is eaten it and he would spit it out into a tulsi plant which my neighbor had downstairs mm. no one knew why he picked the tulsi plant of all things but he did that every day so that was based on him then this thing about uh, the girl who could not stop laughing is based on myself because i have this horrible habit which continues to this day to where if i start laughing i cannot stop <laughs> so yeah so i i keep drawing from and it used to be a problem in class because i would burst out laughing and yeah. um, always be in trouble so yeah so i drew from those experiences and um, pretty much that and there are some universal truths mm. like currently i'm working on this book which is about this ugly worm which can never make any friends because it's so creepy and if you touch it you're going to itch <laughs> so so poor guy he can't make any friends and this is like a universal truth right you uh, say you're from a different country or a different place or a place you've never been to or you moved around a lot as a kid when you you're the new kid in class you have trouble making friends you have to ease yourself in so this came from that place so 
So everything I think is based on some kind of reality and truth. And that's what I try and stick to. Of course, I waver as well, but Hmm. that's the attempt. Wow. Yeah, I was laughing the entire time you said that story about your brother because my sister is exactly the same. And that's the good thing about stories is it's these in psychology of archetypes, but archetypes are like massive that, you know, that can be uh, related to by several people with stories. It's like it's almost like a mini archetype that when you say it, right, people from all across the world or your readers or people who listen to you respond to you by saying that I have a similar version of this story, right? Something like this happened to me as well. So my sister, she um, she used to, jo roti hoti hai, you know, the roti, she would pack it up and dump it behind the headboard of a bed. <laughs> and and during Diwali, you would have like these fossilized rotis and like other stuff come out, like, you know, old ancient fossilized fungus, full <laughs> kiras, kakabars, all of that. And yeah. then she'd share. And then you could just tell by how many days she, you know, went hungry because she didn't want to eat. And it's stuff like that. But my question in that is when it comes to deriving uh, inspiration from your personal life, only yesterday I wrote uh, what was a botched attempt at. Uh, I wrote an article called In Defense of Crassness, you know, because uh, I, I come from a family, rather, my dad loves to swear, grew up in a household where I heard a lot of swearing, and that is responsible for my potty mouth. And the difficult part is how much of my personal life do I put in this essay that is already trying, that is already using the personal to comment on the universal. And mm-hmm. how do you make that difference? Because you, you know, you're you're mentioning your brother. Maybe you're bringing something else from your life. Yeah. I even, you know, read your article about the temples, right? So there's there's mentions of your dad. How do you make sure that, you know, there's a balance, or do you not? Yeah, this is very uh, this is something I keep asking other writers as well. Like, how do you strike a balance where you're talking about very intimate, personal details of your life, but mm-hmm. at the same time there are like especially when you're writing non-fiction like an article or an essay uh, you're drawing from your life but there are people who are going to read this who are related to you who are who you care about and who may not be comfortable being a part of it right um but uh, again i come back to something i read recently which was uh, i think a nobel acceptance prize by or the essay or the speech by louis gluck the uh, person who won the poetry uh, Nobel. So she basically says uh, a poem, a good poem for her is one where it might not reach out to 50,000 people, but there's one person who reads it and feels a connection with it. And then the job is done. You're mm. here to tell a truth as a writer. You're drawing from, maybe you're drawing from your personal experiences, but how else would you know that that is the truth? Mm. How else would you recognize a fact from a statement, uh, unless there is somebody else out there who says, yeah, you know, this have like you said, my sister also did this. I'm sure lots of kids do it, which is why it becomes relatable. And mm. whether somebody is offended or not is a personal call that you need to take. Are you okay with this? Because you set out to be a writer. So now you can't be <laughs> anything but that. Yeah. So if you're being politically correct or you're trying to protect everyone, then I don't know how much of a writer you can be it's of course very difficult like I remember I wrote something about my mother and she was not very comfortable with it so I took it down but by and large now I'm like listen this is it now you're cursed with me (laughs) so I am going to write about things that happened to me how what else do I know Hmm. two comments on that one uh, the writer Chuck Polonick who's written Fight Club and other books he he does that exact same thing where he will go to parties and he'll introduce a story And his intention is to see whether his story incites others to compete, to tell a better version of that story or Mm. to see if they fall into silence, because if they Mm. fall into silence, he's awed Mm. them by a story. His intent is not to awe, it's to relate. If people compete to tell better versions of that story, it means that what he's telling is is spot on. It will be related to by several people across the world. And that's how he chooses his stories, right? When he Mm. writes his books, number one. Number two, uh, the author, David Sidaris, who's written numerous books and, you know, he's a classic American humorist. He talks about right. how he's had to make peace with his family because all of his writing is just based on some degree of dysfunction in his own family. He says some in his family have learned how to play it well and others haven't. But it's this challenge because 
I think when you're trying to be a writer also, the way you look at the world, at least the way I look at the world is, is so comical and funny that I just, I just want to write those things about the specific dysfunctions, the specific neuroticism that makes a family yeah. or makes your friends. And I already do that in private jokes and like, you know, constant commentary with people I love, but it's, it's one thing to write it down and be okay with the nakedness of perhaps your imperfections or the fact that, you know, like your dad swears, or maybe your, you know, mom is uh, something, something, or your sister is that, all of those things. Um, what I want to get to from here is in that sense, where you're trying to be personal, how do you prevent it from being like a sob slam poetry session? You know, where it's just an outpouring of this is what happened to me, and then this happened, and then this happened. How do you how do you make sure? Is do you use perhaps a style guide? Uh, do you you know borrow tips from journalism? What do you do when you write a personal piece? I think that's also um, that's interesting because the struggle or the attempt is not to be uh sense sentimental to the pl- to the point that you're being exploitative mm. you can't exploit a situation um to gather some i see this in a lot of advertising actually where they use you know somebody like a person with a disability or a problem and they use it to sell a product which seems really phony to me um that being said uh, how do you how do you personally have like i think everyone has a meter you know or at least mm. a standard uh, where you know okay i've crossed the line and i'm basically being self indulgent am i being mm. interesting or am i being self indulgent and when you're self indulgent uh, you have the danger of either being extremely artistic or being really boring so i think <laughs> it's a very fine line there's this uh, documentary filmmaker called chris marker who mm. has uh, made this uh, sans soliel and it's beautiful it's basically like um, a bunch of letters uh, over his trip to japan and it's very very intimate and personal and maybe a bit self indulgent but it's still interesting to watch it's still interesting it's a piece of art and uh, at the same time if i'm going for a poetry session and someone is moaning without any meaning to it where i don't relate to any of this then i'm like okay you know maybe you should write in your diary like <laughs> <laughs> <say> this <laughs> so those yeah i think somewhere we need a personal meter or maybe you just need a friend you know or somebody who reads your work and tells you listen this is crap or yeah. who said okay maybe you can park this one and work on so and so points i think having another person's opinion greatly helps and being open to criticism mm. and of course you will have one or two uh, or maybe hundreds of uh, bad experiences where you wrote crap but there's always room to grow and learn from them hmm. independent writers who have their own blogs don't really have a style guide or an editor right so it's basically you're you're working alone on a whim and um, Yeah. If your family and friends are less read, less well read than you are, it's very easy uh, to believe that what you write is of quality and of substance, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. considering that you basically are the founder of Soup and you, you know, also edit at it, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, what is like the workings of your style guide? How do you ensure that articles, essays meet a certain, you know, um, threshold? um so right at the beginning there was a very there was one point of clarity that everything would come from a place of being insightful like it should be a story that i tell that or anybody tells which maybe uh five other people will agree with or feel, relate to so that relatability was the only style guide in the sense mm. that it was never of course we had a few things where we decided we won't do listicles um and i won't uh, put up any sort of news related information mm. also that i did not want to uh, be this you know fast paced website where you're just in this uh, content contest where you're just like putting out stuff every 
other day to get likes it was never that was never the case it was always about uh, creating something carefully slowly meaningfully and at the end of it when someone reads it they should be like oh yeah i feel the same way this person mm. is speaking to me those were the only points and that's why there's some people ask us like oh you're not political you're not that's not true because we do a lot of uh, political stuff as well it's just that it's all kinds of things and it always comes from pers- a personal space i see i see and say i'm a writer which which i've now started to proclaim myself in fact i make videos on youtube um to cater to a hindi audience who's interested in writing because i do believe that you know um if you've ever been to a cbse school or any school yeah um, they they traumatize you with uh believing that using big or complex words is the key to mastery of the english language yeah. especially if you're it's that's not your first language when i went out of school and went mm-hmm. to study in the us the first thing i realized was how wrong they were and so i spent the last four years uh training myself to be able to write in a way and then teach it um but say if i were to pitch you an article right like someone who's you know worked at a couple of magazines and like has written stuff all of that and it's something that's uh, great sounds very witty and all of that how would you what would what would the conversation with you and i look like where you're the editor and i'm the writer how would you tell me to mm. cut things down uh, would there be a word limit uh, would you accept my first draft itself or would you ask me to write a couple of times how, how does that process work like um so it totally depends on what you've written uh normally we don't exceed beyond 2000 words so mm. uh that's something that we try and maintain um we haven't done long form as such in terms of 6000 words and those like caravan style articles it's usually 2000 and mm. uh what i do is um i read it and when i see things which are wrong with it then i suggest these things to the writer say say would could you give me examples of things that are wrong things that writers make mistakes in when they pitch you articles or essays well there are gra- grammatical things of course like hmm. tense and uh, those are of course a basic it's almost like hygiene hmm. uh, sometimes i feel like maybe it's too much information hmm and un- unnecessary information or a sentence is too self indulgent and it doesn't need to be there so i'm going from a point of view of a reader like mm. do i enjoy reading this did i love love reading this or did i feel it was clunky and it needs work um so i'm not approaching it as an editor i'm approaching it as a reader and mm. then uh, when we work with our writers then we make these suggestions to them and it's an open conversation it's never like oh you i put a gun to your head you have to do this and this is how it is it's always a conversation if the writer has a justifiable reason for doing whatever they did which we didn't agree with then we sit back and have a conversation about it but your question about whether we take in the first draft it mm. has happened when it was amazing writing so it has happened of course like some people write absolutely beautifully and i cannot flaw a single I, i'm word. sorry i lost um, the audio for yeah, the last 5 seconds not- I I lost the audio for the last 5 seconds you said something oh, you like some no, people I'm write seen... beautiful drafts yeah after that yeah so some people write beautiful drafts and you can't flaw a single word or sentence in it and that gives me more anxiety actually because i feel like am i doing something wrong how could this be so good so i do uh, i also run it by my assistant editor and uh, another team member so three of us take a call mm. and we all have our points and then we uh, go ahead and share it with the writer if there are no suggestions which is extremely rare then that's great i mean mm. i'm absolutely happy with something like that a friend of mine who has been was a great help when i was living in mumbai for the last year um w- she knew all sorts of like places to eat you know things to read and all of that and i you know saw that she follows soup journal on instagram and always looked to her for insights shout out to manohita if she's if she will watch this um and she said that she follows soup for its stunning photojournalism right and she says they intend they don't intend to be aesthetic but that's what it comes across as she says when i'm reading at rare, rare airports that's what i read i read soup journal and then i decided to test her claim to see if the you know if if the photos and the articles if the if the mixture of the photo and the essay actually um adds to you know a better reading experience and i was surprised that it did because 
and this is what I want wanted to ask you. Say you have a writer and you have a photographer, and you decide let's talk, let's cover Christmas in Bandra because Bandra is such is you know often talked about and all of those things. Do the photographs inspire the writing, or do do does the writing inspire the photographs? Because I feel like in some way the load is taken off because you you are playing off one another. Um, I love this question because it has so many layers to it. So. in in uh, terms of christmas in bandra uh, i had already written the essay it was actually commissioned by goya goya mm. journal which is a food journal and uh, we just decided to run it on both our uh, publications because i know those girls and we worked together in the past so they hired a photographer after i had written the essay and then i took her to all these people that i had met mm. and uh, while we were talking she was shooting them sometimes i wasn't even there for that but uh when it came to an essay like hair or flowers or any other photo essay actually i've always been on the shoot and um it's always um uh, working with the photographer to find the right composition being with them and understanding so we already have in this case there is always a, a style guide as such like i sit with the photographer i brief them and then we arrive on a style that would work for the story and uh, then we find locations and then we go ahead like do a recce and then shoot so mm. it's like a long process and then uh, for every dictionary that we've done i don't know if you've seen those but uh, it's i a, saw a couple yeah yeah so it's an a to z of hair or a to z of flowers and for both of these um we kind of had something in mind i had written some things but uh, street photography or documentary photography is very hard to predict you cannot mm. get what you want you get sometimes better than what you wanted so it's always like an open field and in both these cases when i saw the photographs i had more ideas to write mm. so it was a beautiful relationship especially in the flowers essay with uh, my friend priya darshini who is also a photographer it was a very um, collaborative uh, process where we both enjoyed doing whatever we were doing and it came it came out like that it came out in mm. poems it came out a bit lyrical you know so yeah it yeah. happens both yeah. ways how do you collect words because i was reading the flower essay and like i'll be honest um a lot of the words that um are a lot of words that we use to identify everyday objects or things are words that i don't know and most people don't know you know what i mean like i i remember reading ann lamott's bird by bird that famous writing guide and she says she spent an hour on the phone to know about the thing that they attach on top of a wine cork screws and then fi- finally she got in touch with this old guy who worked in the company he was 80 years old and he t- told her exactly what it was hmm. and and because i wonder how you're able to identify this flower is a bougainvillea or this flower is a mogra especially when it's not something you hear in common parlance at least for me because i don't hear it to be able to write about something that you don't don't hear in common parlance does that come from perhaps i don't know keeping a dictionary in hand or asking people what things mean like how much of how much of this job of writing essays involves collecting terms that you haven't heard before mm. in the flower essay i think while we were shooting it i came across a lot of interesting flowers i mm. don't think i named them as uh, their flower names but more about uh, the experience or the feeling that they give um, when you're involved with a flower so that being said uh, i think research is an important part of writing any anything that's not fiction or even fiction sometimes mm. but knowing your field is very very important so i would say that collecting those terms or knowing and understanding those things if they are not common parlance is probably a great thing uh, because it's just going to give you a deeper and finer understanding of what you're doing so mm-hmm. it would be unfair to a number of people and even the subject uh, if you didn't know enough about what you were doing you should know quite a bit if not a lot to you know um, touch upon a topic so i like i love flowers and i work i mean i grow a lot of plants so mm. it was something that i enjoyed doing 
now uh, there was also this book commissioned by pratham on shakuntala devi before the movie came out hmm. and it was meant to be a children's book and i'm really bad at math so i was like i don't want to do this book because i don't think i'll do justice to a subject i hate right. so so but then uh, uh, the editor actually told me maybe it's good because you don't understand or you're not good at math then you'll probably explain it to a child better because you will try and understand it and that was true because i had read up about her a lot and understood her and what kind of a person she was and after all mm-hmm. of that then we decided to write the book and of course the book didn't come out that's a different story but research was so important in understanding and applying that made it more creative in a way mm-hmm. so i think it it's important my my contention with research lies in the fact that as a university student um i knew the confines of what i had to research i knew that right. i could i could re- I, these academic sources were valid and these were not and hmm. that i could search these journals and these journals were off the bounds right mm-hmm. so there was a structure but when you run an open ended publication that mm-hmm. that is you know more about um uh, personal personality and whims things things of that nature stories that you deliberately pick out and say this is important right yeah. w- what is the ceiling and and the the ceiling and like the floor on that research where, where do you define ki, this is too much research or maybe this source isn't as adequate do you perhaps yeah. you know use some journalistic tools i actually come from an advertising background so oh, i do not have any journalistic tools at all i'm just working with my background as a copywriter in fact mm. uh, so again when you uh, work in advertising you're given briefs on anything from a washing machine to a sanitary napkin yeah i also am a bachelor in ad- advertising i worked with a couple of briefs as well i know exactly what you're talking about yeah yeah so you need to do everything from a 13 year old girl's mind and her pimples to like you know uh, uh, an older single man who has who's buying a washing machine for the first time hmm. so there's such a varied number of things that are in your brain and you must know about so because from there from that understanding can you write a script or an ad that actually makes sense to the person buying it so uh, my research is based on those things like um, do i know enough about the technicalities of this Uh, mm. if i had to write a story about it will i know enough for the person who knows a lot reading about it to understand it so mm. it's not like i go to a library and i take all like 50 books and i read all of them but i i do or uh, read a, i do a concise research which is relevant to the subject and the quantity of information that i'm myself putting out mm. like um i wrote something about uh, this cookbook uh, which is by this lady called s meenakshi ammal and uh, in that case i uh, asked questions from, from my own family members my grandmother other my mom i found books i read up everything i could about her i also tried to contact her family members and then i tried making some of the recipes so that was like a uh, research which was more personal and trying to understand that person um but i think like sometimes i've written for scroll and there the research is much more academic because they are very particular mm, right. about how it's not personal writing it's more like um an article which make mostly in nature which is a comment not from my point of view but based on fact depending on what you're writing i think your research is valid but i feel it's best to know everything you can there's no floor or ceiling it's more like i come across this fact you're like, you're like an investigator oh this is interesting this is another clue this is another clue and then you form a whole hmm. picture so, yeah one of the great things my advertising professor in college taught me is to consume everything which is terrible advice for your <laughs> mind but but also because it it allows you to gain to see inanimate things and even like you know stuff that people just glaze over as important information where yeah. you know you have insight into something that is so obvious that it's overlooked now yeah. in terms of writing for the internet which is different from writing for print obviously and yeah. different for writing copy because you know your the success of your copy depends on you know sales or like <laughs> did you create brand awareness right right when you're writing these essays um what kind of feedback do you get in what form do you get it 
And how does that then inform your writing? Because even though you're not immersed in the news cycle, you still are writing very contemplative pieces. Mm. People will respond to them, right? As, as you send it out, right? And so how does that shape the next essay that comes out? What is the, what is the nature of a feedback cycle, basically? Um, so it's very difficult because when you write um, anything on social media, which is put on social media, there is a lot of, it, it's easy to get carried away and feel mm. like, oh, I'm writing really well. Mm. But <laughs> maybe it's so important to have uh, people who are writers for friends or people who, um, or even, I'm not talking about friends, but somewhere in your circle or in your immediate vicinity, it's good to have a voice of reason or uh, one or two people who will tell you like it is. Mm. So you like um, when you work with scroll, for instance, as an editor who you can trust and depend on when you're writing yourself for yourself, it's just you. So you're basically, basically it's all on you. You better do a good job. So then I think it works to have a team which is diverse in its understanding. Hmm. And as for feedback and comments and how they shape the next one, the only thing that I feel uh, I may have gone very wrong on is um, that only now uh, are we woke enough or a degree of woke uh, mm. to kind of understand the various things that are existing that you cannot write from your privileged point of view only. You have to be discerning. You have to understand that it's not just uh, South Indian women wearing saris in upper caste families. There are other kinds of people. You have to represent so many different ideas and ideologies and you are responsible for having a well-rounded opinion, which is not, um, which isn't um, ignorant, ignorant, and which isn't restricted to yourself, because wow. that's just so unfair to everyone else, and you're just one percent of this entire world. So, I think that I've learned of uh, being on online and being on social media and trying to gauge how to write in a less self-involved way in that sense you would really hate my essay then <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um i think well, you hate it because it's it's written from the standpoint of why i think people should why people should arm themselves with swears and it's it's very in your face and quite rude i think um and very sharp in its language you know whereas i see that sort of writing that you do is is beautiful it's almost like the words themselves have gilded gold on, on the outside. My, mine is very rough shot. Um, but I also feel like, and this is sort of where I want to see how you, how you take this, um, this drive to be representative of different voices can often stand in the way of authenticity and truth. Yes. And even uh, foster a level of blandness because you're, afraid of making or afraid of not offending anyone and and so it it just becomes this i don't know it just becomes like a mm. luster piece well, i think so too like it can't be tokenism it can't be like oh i'm doing a photo shoot and i'm getting this girl who is big and this girl who is tiny and this girl who is fair and this girl who's dark that's rubbish of course that's, that's the dumb ads of severe ignorance and you're mm. basically just pandering so mm. i'm never saying that we need to pander i'm saying we need to be like there's nothing wrong with rough writing or you know uh like what you were saying you don't have to write beautifully i i think some of the best right like i think shugi bain is um the there's a book which just got um, nominated or it won actually the book award this year shugi bain is that an indian writer no it's an irish writer and i'm not even sure if i'm pronouncing the name right hmm. it's, <laughs> but it's it's about this boy whose mother is an alcoholic and he's dealing hmm. with her, uh, his sexuality at 13 and i haven't read the book but I know it's not going to be like easy and palatable and everything cute and nice. That's, that's never very, that's never good in the first place. It's boring. It'll never be memorable. Mm. So um, never the effort to please everyone, but uh, an effort to be sensitive to everyone. Right. 
Hmm. So I think there's a distinction between just pandering and genuinely coming from a place of I understand you, I see you, and I want to include you, and I want to correct myself when I don't. Hmm. That was that was the idea. So yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the same way why some great stand-up comics will write their jokes with their worst critic in mind, address that first, and then sort of break the tension by saying something even more absurd. Yeah. But you know, in comedy, it's so difficult. I don't know. I I'm not a comedian, nor do I write so much mm. humorous stuff. But it's really hard because no matter what you do, you seem to offend someone. So I'm not for that at all. I think there should be freedom of speech as long as you're not like an outright sexist or like a casteist or you know mm. some kind of racist. But there has to be room for a good joke. Like right. I think you can't be offended by everything. Like I think Ricky Gervais gets a lot of flack. He's I don't know why exactly, but I sometimes follow his Twitter and I see him getting uh, bashed constantly. But yeah, yeah, there has to be the room for a joke, you know. Yeah, I think comedians and jesters are probably the last standing truth tellers we have in our society, Absolutely. and and we need that because it's on everyone's mind, and they just dare to say it. They shouldn't be punished yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, I wanna take a segue and talk to you about focus, right? Because we are not in the era where we had long attention spans like our ancestors did, or even like writers of the 19th century or the 20th century. Mm-hmm. We live in an era where um, we are as much writers as we are publishers online, right? Mm-hmm. So what do you set aside a time every day to write that is perhaps at that time you don't use technology and uh, how do ideas come to you? Do you write them down on a phone, phone, phone notes, and then, you know, transcribe them, um, you know, some, something along. Basically what I'm asking you is what are your routines around writing and how do you focus considering that you also have to publish and run a journal? Yeah, it's um, something I struggle with actually. So mm-hmm. we have this section called Writers on Reading on Zoom and I make sure every interviewer asks the writer, like, what's your routine? Because I'm curious, how do you manage? Like you said, it's so distracting to be alive, you know? There's so much to say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what. Like while I'm talking to you, I know I'm also thinking of tea. And yeah. I'm also you can go have tea. tea. No, I'm just saying like, yeah, I don't yeah. know, like I have at any point uh, 25 tabs open you know Mm. whether I'm reading them or not it's like very hard for me to focus so what I do is um, I wake up early in the morning at seven o'clock if I have any ideas I tend to write them down this is not something I do on the daily Mm. which is um, something I'm struggling and trying to incorporate but I wake up early and I try not to look at my phone for that one one and a half hours and lately I found that there are certain apps which eat into your time uh, so I've deleted them and I only mm. check them on my laptop, Yeah, which is helping me a lot, you know, because I'm not wasting my time scrolling. That's a disgusting habit. I've muted most things which are boring mm. or like suck your energy and your brain space. Yeah. But um, as for a writing routine, I think it's important to write every day for one or two hours. Um, I don't do that every day, but I'm trying to. Mm. So I'm trying to write for an hour every day. And I'm hoping sometimes when you're into the process of writing, you end up writing for five, six hours and you lose track of time. That's the best. But mm-hmm. if you can't allot that kind of time, I think two to three hours a day would be great. I want to talk about knives, knives uh, in particular that uh, refer. that is, sorry, knives as in editing. I, I was thinking of some elaborate wordplay that was going to get me to that end punchline, <laughs> but it didn't happen. So just straight up editing. Uh, uh, the people who watch my videos on YouTube where, you know, I, I give writing advice in Hindi. Yeah. These are the videos that are on editing that, that get the the least, least amount of views mm. and people hate it. And uh, they want me to review their first drafts all the time. Mm. And I've read all my first drafts ever since I was a kid. And I know, I know they are shite. So they expect me to sort of say, you know, please validate my writing, blah, 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 blah. Right. But, what I tell my viewers often is, uh, you know, you have to murder your darlings. And editing is such a painful process for some, uh, yeah. especially when you consider yourself a wordsmith, like someone who's really witty, right? And you write all these witty things yeah. that that's, you know, sound very nice, but don't do much on the gut level for yeah. your writing. So maybe you could, you know, take me through your editing process, 
say mm. you have a first draft you had like an inkling of an idea mm. uh, how does the editing process happen does it happen in bursts do you do it in one go um do you get friends along and then all those things um now i'm a manic editor i keep editing so mm. i write um so whatever i've written so this happens more with short stories actually uh, and that's a form i'm trying to understand and learn myself but um, i write then i leave it aside for two days i approach it again with fresh eyes then mm. i remove chunks of it and then i i go i i go back at least five times on an average for an article or an essay um but for a short story it takes me sometimes as long as a month to six months to keep chopping refining keeping you know and i don't think you have the luxury of time to keep doing that uh, mm-hmm. but what i've see- noticed is when you uh, when you give it a bit of time and come back to it um you realize what you got carried away by and mm. what you are like you know makes no sense now and is completely unnecessary and what uh, was something that you'd hidden somewhere in your sentences and maybe it needs a bit of polishing and maybe that was the whole idea that's happened right. a number of times like uh, i've written so many things and there's this little thing which was ignored but maybe that was a theme i didn't know at that point so and also like uh, recently i learned a couple of writing fixes that a narrative plot or a story doesn't have to have a certain flow like a mm. meant b b uh, got married and c murdered them both no it could be starting with c murdered them both and then it goes into mm. you know so you can always restructure your narrative in various ways after you write it so you've basically unlearned how to do the whole linear jig where you say point a point b point c conclusion that sort of thing which is yeah, yeah. i didn't learn anything at all so i'm just figuring it out <laughs> i see i see yeah yeah um and are there indian writers in english that you greatly admire maybe they could be contemporaries maybe they could be people you know um who existed post independence india for once i know i uh, recently read kamala markandeya's nectar and receive mm-hmm. um and so, this is someone i did not know about i okay. read it i found her book through g tiles book re- recommendations that he gave to some newspaper about 6 or 7 years ago mm-hmm. and upon reading this book i was surprised to see and feel just how idyllic the book is at the start and how it ends on this note of abject hunger and 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 poverty in a way but there's this acceptance that the protagonist have you read the book no i haven't no but i'm you, you you do know what kamla who kamla markandeya yeah yeah i do but i haven't read any yeah yeah so i was surprised to find because you know the the back blurb has things like shashi tharoor saying that yeah, Mar- famous yeah, yeah Mar- markandeya was the pioneer for all of us indians writing in english right so mm-hmm. are there particular writers that you look to for inspiration or um, even contemporaries indian writers specifically um actually the one person i keep thinking about is uh vivek shanbag who is hmm. written who's that he's written so he's a regional author uh, who's been translated and he's written this book called gachar gochar which is my favorite book gachar gochar yeah you have to read it it's just uh everything i like about writing you know it's so um it's telling you so many dark and very painful things but under the guise of a very simple tale it's simple to read easy to read it's very real and gently observed but at the same time you're reading about the dark side of an indian family almost hmm and um yeah so this is one writer i wish i could write like him it's uh, uh what really stands out in every good piece of writing i read is the simplicity it's not complicated it's not it's not trying to force a style down your throat it's not doing anything it's just telling your story so well that you're deep inside it and you didn't even know it you're imagining these people you're living their world so i loved his writing and right now i'm i'm honestly only discovering regional authors from india hmm. and i love uh, you you asked me about indian authors only right so another person i like is benjamin uh, benjamin oh. so basically he's written this uh, book called uh, goat days which was also made into a movie 
Mm. About immigrants in um, basically slave labor in the Middle East, you mm. know, and again, it's it's beautiful. It's very uh, painful to read, and it's gut wrenching, but it's it's excellent. And apart from that, of course, everybody loves Arundhati Roy. So do I. Um, mm. And um, yeah, there are plenty of Indian authors. Uh, that i really like but vivek shanbag is my number one right now i see yeah fantastic um i love jeet thail's poetry also. yeah i haven't read his poetry i've read all of his books Excellent. just not his poetry yeah. yeah um i sent him crazed fan messages on instagram a couple of times <laughs> and he was like we can meet for a drink once all this lockdown ends and then you know i ended up in delhi so that never happened i have to still hit him up um but it's it's weird it's strange to um basically imbibe the world of an author to live it uh to tell your friends about it and then yeah. the grand closure is when you decide you can meet that author mm-hmm. have there been bitter sweet moments in your own life where you know you had maybe like a literary hero or a heroine right and they didn't turn out to be <laughs> they were just mortals you know Salman Rushdie. Yeah, yeah. What what is the story? I didn't meet him, but I just follow his Twitter, and I'm like, does not appeal to me in the least. Why is that? Like a little bit like he's trying to. <laughs> I don't know. I I hope I hope I don't. Uh, I don't want to sound. Don't worry. Podcast episodes don't go viral. <laughs> <laughs> no but i don't want to sound pompous in like judging an author who is obviously a very very good author but i was a bit disappointed when i followed his twitter and i saw him fighting back with each and every person trolling and i i i did not expect that and i felt that was so unnecessary so mm-hmm. yeah i think he is one of those people um but by and large whoever um whichever authors i have had the opportunity to feature on soup have been very interesting people um and i don't think i've ever been disappointed by their personality mm. but i also feel like it's not fair to um judge a piece of writing and then go back to the author's personality because a lot of people are horrible but they have a few talents you know <laughs> then you're setting yeah. yourself up for disappointment and i think this is a social media uh, unfortunate uh, thing that we have we used to have heroes now we cannot have heroes because yeah. everyone is too available and too seen and then you know their flaws and maybe they are human beings now they are not heroes yeah so i would yeah missed I would yeah i, I yeah. Yeah. I think cultivating mystery will be the circuit breaker of social media. Yes. I agree. I mean, uh, it's a fine line, isn't it? Because if you do cultivate that mystery, how mysterious are you allowed to be? Uh mm-hmm. before people lose interest. When can you trust. afford to be mysterious? How big yeah. do you have to be mysterious? So all of those things are there. But uh yeah, like usually when I fancy someone, I just hope I don't see their social media presence because I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather not know. Mira when um do you have like a small journal that you just use to write for yourself and when you have ideas are you writing them down in a small notebook are you putting them down in your phone notes are you doing any other thing basically what i'm asking is how does the ideation phase of your essays occur it's my phone in fact today i was going through my notes and i found something i didn't about mm. uh, yeah so i found like couple of ideas because i had the time to go through my phone notes today right uh, there are like plenty of grocery lists and uh, things like uh, oh i maybe i should exercise tomorrow kind of thing and between them there are like lot of sprinklings of ideas and notes and essays and the beginning of uh, uh, something or the other i find it just much more useful because um, uh, by nature i'm not so careful and mm-hmm. it's very likely that i might just lose this notebook and drop it somewhere and have no idea where it is so i find my phone very very useful for this so mm-hmm. i do write everything on notes and then how does it get translated into like you know an actual article do you are you writing on a laptop have you do you ever use paper and pen i use paper and pen also so mm-hmm. first draft out the talking points like the beginning middle end my research uh all the things that i uh, want this essay to be and mm. then i begin writing it on my laptop yeah 
Hmm. I've just started using software for writing, but uh, this but is just, um, so there's something called a uh, final draft. Hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to write a screenplay, so this is all work in progress. But I found that great because you uh, basically break down characters, and first you understand all your characters. Who are these people? Why why are they doing the things they're doing? And that I think also helps you write better once you know each person's motivation and existence and so on. Hmm. And do you have any words of advice for people who want to pitch to maybe soup, including myself, and yeah. <laughs> and um, people who want to write online without necessarily the hopes of getting viral, but just with putting out stuff that they can be proud of? Um. The first thing would be to not approach it from a point of view of going viral ever. Like mm. I think that would be again a very big mistake um, because then I don't know what you're writing and why are you writing it. Uh, the second thing, if you're pitching to Soup, uh, we are we are a very small uh, organization and we put only four stories out each month, so mm. we have a very very slow editorial process to be honest, but. Um, if this essay or article is of interest to us, it's usually when it's coming from an insightful point of view. And um, apart from that is the craft and the style which appeal to us. So I think if you understand the tone of voice of Soup, you kind of get a picture of the kind of stuff that we do. And um, a complete essay is always better than a pitch. Mm. We actually prefer that because then you understand the writer's style and where they're going with it. Um, so that is one way to do it about advice for writers writing online. I think, um, it's important to be truthful. Uh, don't get influenced by a style online. Don't get influenced by what other popular writers are writing. Just write yourself as you see yourself and write what you actually want to say and what you mm. believe in. So I think being truthful is the one thing that matters and the only thing that matters when you're writing. Yeah. There's several, you know, essays that I read come across, which have beautiful words, but very little drive. Um, and you know, for a fact that this person lives in a flat and yet says that when I hear outside, I can hear the trees and the birds. And I'm like, this is, this is a trope that you've seen conventional quote unquote writers do. And you've decided ki, I'm going to use this, <laughs> and put it into my essay and somehow that's going to make me uh, someone who writes beautiful sentences, but it's not the truth. What I really want to see is something like, talk to me about the pond that spit outside the lift uh, <laughs> where you stay at, you know, talk to me about, you know, the lizard on the wall, something like that. Uh, because I think that that is more real. It's stuff that people will overlook because for some reason in the average Indian's mind, the easiest thing to do is to write about, like you said earlier, birds, yeah. flowers, trees, and all of those things. Um, mm. But it's tough to write about um, dysfunctional families or architecture or why a certain community has certain beliefs. Like it's, these things are tough. Less and less people are willing to take up those challenges. I see a lot of writers on LinkedIn also, and they write these great motivational self helpy you know, essays mm. on... Uh, team team leadership, all of those things. And it's all great and stuff, but I rarely see people just being absolutely honest in a way that's not, like you said, self-indulgent. Yeah. So I don't know. That's more, that's more of a comment than a question. You can feel free to not respond to that. No, I agree with you. I don't agree with the fact that you can't see beauty anywhere. You can see, or maybe it's, it's your way of looking at the world is, is not from looking at only the bad or the, uh, things that trouble but also from a point of view of appreciation maybe mm. you can be someone who lives in an apartment and yet looks out and sees the birds and they are giving you a measure of hope of course maybe you you don't have anything else to look forward to except that bird that comes out of your window every day so I wouldn't agree that you only have to write things that are uncomfortable or disturbing but even when you're writing things that are beautiful, it can't be fake. It has to come from within. That just something that you genuinely feel is is mm. more important than anything else. I would say. Fantastic. 
Um, Mira, before we, you know, officially end this lovely conversation, I'm surprised by how lucid I was today. I was having a terrible day. Um, <laughs> are there any questions that you would want to ask me? Things that um, would serve as feedback, anything else, commentary? Well, I really like this. It was very freewheeling and very relaxed and all very interesting uh, topics. Um, I would love to actually see more of it. So is there somewhere that I can follow and uh, watch a lot of your uh, work? I mean, I, I remember you saying you uh, on YouTube, you uh, kind of have videos on writing. Yeah, yeah. I I don't think you would like those um very much because because <laughs> you're because you're a practicing writer. Um it's just very bare bones stuff that is mainly around eliminating the fear of writing in people because I have a hypothesis and I may be wrong because you know it's just one one man's perspective but I feel like um for some reason uh, the way uh, you know most 16 17 18 year olds feel about writing is that it it's something that the shashi thurus of the world can do mm-hmm. not something that they can do mm-hmm. um even speaking in english is unless you're from a metropolitan city is something that happens in a very transactional manner in school when you're forced to speak to your teacher in english so there's a lot of phobia around being able to express yourself and dialogue with yourself in english that is my mission to eradicate and say that you know you can basically just and the same way you dialogue with your friends in your regional language you can do the same thing in english and it'll help your articulation it'll help you uh you know get a job it'll help you all of those all of those things right so that's what i try to do on that channel is to introduce little micro concepts that help people in their journey forward as i'm learning them not trying to be uh you know like uh, scut above the rest just sharing whatever i write write about it because the book that won the booker this year is exactly that yeah in a dialect that not everybody gets and he wrote it anyway so that's amazing what what, what is this about I told you it's about his alcoholic mother. Oh right, 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 right. Yeah, what, what was the yeah. hard name of the author? I forget. Shin, Shinji, Benji. Sorry, <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but I look it up. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing. I think I think that's gonna. I think it'll be nice to see regional writers get translated into English. Yes, I think that's you important, know? and it's happening a lot more than ever before. Hmm. Fantastic. Where can people find you and your work? Um. I have an Instagram handle. I pretty much put up all my work there, so it's mm. called One Meer Cat. <laughs> mm. Yeah, cool. And they can check out the soup at the soup. soup is, jo- uh, the soup dot website. The soup dot website. Fantastic. Yeah. And so that's pretty much it. That's all I had for today. Thank you for being um, so conversational and answering my questions. Uh, Thank you for having me. It was yeah. lovely talking. likewise i hope your taxes get sorted out no they're going to get sorted out this is this is just a start if i have more of these conversations hopefully someone will sponsor me and i can just use this as income <laughs> <laughs>